All right, uh, I'm Rex, and I'm going to give a talk about a series of major breaches in the cannabis compliance software industry in the year 2017. I gave this talk before. I think uh, there was a guy here who like seen it, and I was like, somebody's going to have seen this talk twice, and that's pretty funny to me. Uh, I gave it a few days ago at another security convention called b Size that happened right before this one. And they helped me polish it up, so you guys are going to get the better version. But okay, so this is cruising, cruising the cannabis highway. Who am I? I'm a longtime software developer, a web developer mainly, full stack. Uh, I've been to a handful of hacker summer camps. It's a lot of fun. Not in InfoSec, though I do work for some InfoSec companies doing front end stuff. And I'm also nosy AF. Uh, with this talk, I hope to give you an overview of the cannabis industry. Uh, present a compelling narrative that touches upon uh, disclosure. Uh, this is definitely going to be an exercise in OSINT. There won't be any elite exploits, though. However, there is someone who will be presenting right after me, and they will be going over specific uh, surface area attacks for point-of-sale stuff in cannabis. And really, I just hope to foster a more general or broader discussion about InfoSec and cannabis because it's sorely needed. Uh, so why should you care? Um, a lot of times when you come to uh, Hacker Summer Camp, you see a lot of talks about people where people basically uh, discuss the current state of some industry, and then they say, oh, this is very terrible, and we all need to do a better job of securing it. And sometimes it's something like medical and medical devices, and that's really important. And sometimes it's other things. But I feel like cannabis is one of those similar watershed sort of industries um, because, well, there's a lot of new tech coming into it. A lot of players trying to corner this uh, compliance software market, and so a lot of people are potentially cutting corners to uh, cut their time to market and have a greater market share, but of course that means more problems, more bugs. Uh, there's also a lot of high monetary value, obviously, in both cannabis itself and therefore in all the ancillary tools. Uh, there's also a high number of policy touch points. So we have lobbyists and lawmakers who are active in the political space as it pertains to cannabis, but then we also have software makers who are making software for dispensaries, and they're also making software, very often, these same companies for uh, compliance tracking at the state level, and then they're also lobbying uh, in politics. So to me, that's kind of funny, maybe potentially a conflict of interest, but I'm not a lobbyist, so I couldn't say for sure. Um, and potentially this is an untapped market, right? For as much learning and drunken partying as goes on at Hacker Summer Camp, there are also all sorts of like random 2 a.m. business deals being made in fancy suites while people get intoxicated further. So maybe this is something somebody wants to look into and maybe there's money in, I don't know. So without further ado, cannabis. The sweet nugs you smoke with your friends or whatever, uh, except not really. Uh, we're really talking about the cannabis industry, which in 2017 was actually a $9.2 billion industry in all of North America. So that makes it kind of less like my burnout stoner neighbor and more like your rich friend's even more affluent uncle. Um, in putting this village together and also doing research for this talk, I've met or at least read about a number of guys who like don't smoke at all yet have extensive cannabis portfolios. So that's where the future is headed, I think, if we don't pay attention. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We just can't let it be only that. Um, and another thing uh, related to that is like, you know, a lot of people are saying like, okay, well, maybe I'll get into it. Maybe it's like the green rush or whatever. But if these guys are doing this, you've realistically already missed the mark pretty much. Uh, but in that light, uh, the cannabis supply chain is probably a lot more complex than you probably think. And it looks like this. Uh, the green lines are product, actual cannabis. The black lines are data. So to walk through it sort of quickly, you start all the way on the left. We have grow ops, which are where the cannabis is grown, obviously. It could be hydroponic, could be otherwise organic in dirt, outdoors. Uh, that can be shipped to a processing facility to be turned into some other form that people enjoy consuming. And then from there, it's sent to dispensaries. Sometimes it's just sent directly to dispensaries, and they'll make their own little pre-rolls and wrap it in a box and put branding on it, but whatever. Uh, and then it goes to the customer. Now, at every step along that chain that I just pointed out, 
people or these organizations are interfacing with the government in some way, usually through the form of compliance tracking software. So when the grow op starts their grow, uh, they'll often tag the plant with perhaps an NFC tag or some other sort of radio tech, um, or if not, then just a more uh, low key, whatever the plastic lock numbered equivalent is. Uh, and then when they pass it off to the processing, processing facility, they, off, they also have to input data into the system. The dispensaries have to input data into the system about where their products come from uh, and also potentially who they're selling it to. And a lot of these dispensaries have extensive profiles on their customers. Um, we also have uh, some sales analytics. So these dispensaries are furthermore sometimes uploading this data to do number crunching to figure out which products sell the best and why. Uh, we also have grow analytics that is becoming more of a thing, not as popular as the sales analytics perhaps, but grow ops, uh, I guess kind of like what Harry was saying, you know, entering their data into these systems to be told, uh, to figure out how to get the best yield, right? If this was my best crop, what did I do to get that and how can I replicate it? Um, and then far over there, we have ancillary products by which um, that's, that's a pretty broad umbrella as I'm using it. Could be anything from uh, smart nutrient dispensers uh, that prosumer level growers are using to uh, smart vapes I'm considering. Well, any vape really, but vapes are becoming smart and inter internet connected, which, yeah. Uh. So here are some of the major players in the cannabis point of sale space. We have Metric, which is a subsidiary of Franwell, which is just a more general tech company like a GE or something, I would say. And I just cherry picked some of these stats because they just, uh, to me, they give you an idea of like the scale that these organizations are operating at. So they claim to have tracked 4 million plants and 3 million parcels. And also, they're pretty known, I think, for, um, eh, yeah, they're pretty known for uh, their, their radio tag technology. So I almost get the sense that like they, while they do have software that exists at both the dispensary and the state level, they also make a lot of money off of that and have a lot of market share around their radio technology. Another player is Biotrack THC. Uh, I believe the original company is still around, Biotrack. They basically made uh, medication dispensers that go in hospitals. Like if anybody watched that show, Nurse Jackie, and saw the part where she had her boyfriend sort of uh, turn the Pixis off so she could get the opioids distributed without leaving a trace, or, or, or maybe you didn't see that show. Uh, but they pivoted into the medical cannabis space, mainly through uh, dispensary and compliance tracking software. And then we have MJ Freeway, it's pretty much the main uh, topic of this talk. They are the originators of the idea of seed to sale. Um, and that is what I described in the previous slide, basically the tracking that happens at each stage. Uh, but what are we actually talking about here, right? MJ Freeway, uh, they were really one of the largest point of sale providers in the industry, uh, present in many, many states at the state compliance level, present in probably, you know, an overwhelming majority of dispensaries. And as such, they had a lot of data to lose. So we're talking about a breach that happened on or about November 19, 2016, with no data loss. That is, according to MJ Freeway, and according to them, that is what they were told by a third party security auditing company. Uh, but in actuality, it was two breaches in around two months that time, uh, with data loss, as they would find out some months after the fact. Uh, except no, maybe it's more like three really uh, with a potential pivot into government infrastructure and the definite loss of personally identifiable information and a several month outage. And also uh, in one of these states, um, which you know, this hasn't necessarily been attributed, but I think the attacks are probably related. That's me speculating. But um, there was a state where attackers modified um, basically some live delivery information of cannabis restocking. So some pretty gnarly stuff is happening. And I was kind of like, all right, this is crazy. Um, and so I started reading more about it. And this is some th these are some things that were said from uh, MJ Freeway's marketing department, uh, that they were the victim of a vicious cyber attack, and also uh, that they're only really coming out to say this because a lot of people are saying that this was not a hack and not an attack, and it absolutely was. 
which is interesting when you get hacked and a lot of data is lost and your customers say, maybe your DevOps person just fucked up. Um, and then on January 8th, our clients began to experience the effects of this. The MJ Freeway system went offline for all our clients who also had no access to the MJ Freeway site. Uh, so and this is actually, uh, I went to a dispensary a few years ago here in Las Vegas during DEF CON, and I was able to talk to the bud tender that I met there about her experience while this was going down. And this is pretty anecdotal, but I guess their boss walked in and they said, hey, the system's down, we can't really do anything. And he said, you're all liars who try the most to avoid work. Uh, so I wanted more anecdotal uh, evidence because even though objective evidence is probably better, anecdotal is still fun. Um, so I went to Reddit, which is the best place for subjective hot takes. Um, but instead, I actually found a lot of people who are involved in the industry just really venting their frustrations. And uh, you don't have to read all of this, but to sum it up, they did not do a good job of disclosing that this was happening. And a lot of people found out, just like I said with my friend, by going into work and finding that the system was down. Uh, and then over the course of the next few weeks and months, they would receive a lot of mixed signals about, you know, what kind of backups were available uh, because the attackers targeted the backups as well, by the way. Um, and when they would have the backups rolled out, have the system back up, a lot of people jump ship. So my first reaction is like, oh my God, why is nobody talking about this? This is a big deal. This company, as I came to realize, is so large in the cannabis community, uh, or in the cannabis industry, rather. Um, but as it turns out, that's inaccurate. Everybody was talking about it, like from uh, national print-based uh, news publications to mom and pop blogs that focus on the cottage cannabis industry. So a lot of people were talking about it, but still, that made me, uh, that still gave me a funny feeling though, because I'm like, all right, if everybody is talking about it, then why didn't I hear about it? If major news outlets are talking about it, why isn't everybody aware of this? And I think they just did a really good job of sort of getting in front of it and controlling the narrative. So I do give them kudos for that, actually. Uh, but like I said, you know, looking at anecdotal stuff and just reading a lot of speculation from a lot of people. Uh, and one of the things I read about was that the source code was hacked too. So not only was personally identifiable information leaked uh, and put on the Pirate Bay, by the way, but also source code was uploaded to GitLab. And uh, initially, I think MJ Freeway came out with a statement saying that this wasn't real. Um, I don't understand what they meant by real. Did they mean like that's fake news or more like we didn't do that, so please don't look at our code that's there? Uh, it got taken down pretty quickly though but it was definitely posted up on the Pirate Bay as well. Uh, so I grabbed that and I started finding any kind of news source I could, and there were a lot of them. Uh, and I figured that the timing was gonna be important, so I made a spreadsheet, as one does, with a timeline. Uh, and then, like I said, since everybody was talking about it, I grabbed every news article that I could. And what was interesting was that some of them, like it was interesting to see their perspective and where they were getting the information from. Some of them would just say stuff like, you know, they would take a very centrist approach and say, outage affects major, you know, cannabis point of sale, lots of dispensaries having trouble. And then other people would be like, MJ Freeway fucked up really bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then some people, even though there were these sort of different perspectives, some of the uh, authors of these articles did manage to find nuggets here and there that I couldn't really find anywhere else that really led me further down the rabbit hole. Uh, so back to Reddit. Um, so I read the post from the people who were in the industry and directly affected, but then in that mix, were these weird things where like these people were just sort of chiming in with what looked like hot takes? This one dude is like, yeah, I know the guy who made this software and I've been in IT for 20 years and here's how I think it happened, which sounds really suspicious. Uh, and apparently I wasn't the only one that thought that because MJ Freeway subpoenaed Reddit and also Google for information about all of those accounts that sort of had firsthand knowledge, I guess, thinking that maybe they were affiliated with the tax amount. That's pretty logical thinking in my opinion. I mean, I don't know that I think that they did have something to do with it, but it's worth checking. Uh, so like I said, I was interested in the source code as well because a lot of the other stuff is subjective. Source code is pretty objective. So I went on the Pirate Bay. I grabbed this torrent. Uh, I, also, I was told by the EFF that it's very important that you know that I got it from the Pirate Bay. Uh, 
But what you're looking at here took me about four months to download to get to that 46.1%. Uh, and that's after fiddling with like distributed, decentralized peers and all that stuff. Um, and really, just what I realized is that nobody was interested in this source code. And going back to Reddit, I found posts that were like, who gives a shit about this leak? Uh, it's really old Drupal code that was never patched. So I'm not going to learn anything from that. And I was a little bit disheartened because even if that's true, I still wanted to know uh, what was going on in there. Uh, and then somebody told me to do another search. And I was like, duh, I didn't think of that. And as it turned out, this code was reposted a number of times in the Pirate Bay. So to me, that makes an interesting narrative. You have some people saying, I don't care, and other people saying, no, please, please look, please. Uh, so uh, again, I don't know what that means, but it makes my stomach, I don't know, it makes my spider sense tingle or whatever. So uh, I grabbed this and started digging in. Um, so OK. First off, just even doing this directory listing, not a great start for them, I mean. Like, I think it's pretty cool that like, I'm all up in their shit. Uh, so I'm not a hacker, like I was saying. Uh, I have a pretty decent background in consulting, by which I mean working for a company that outsources my services to another company. And so I've worked with a lot of other developers on various teams in various configurations. Uh, I've worked with offshore teams and other remote teams and things like that. And one thing I can tell you is, uh, if you look at, so you see how there's up at the top it says CC Leaf, and then if you read down there are other ones that like Just Leaf or like Washington Leaf or those other things. What you're seeing there is like, like if I can sort of put on my like Oracle Psychic hat a little bit, this was a team that could not decide on a software development process that would allow them to share a common core and easily build a custom customer functionality on top of it. So what they chose to do instead was just split the repo five times, which is a pain in the fucking ass. Uh, I actually have a tattoo on my leg of a man named Melvin Conway. He makes something called Conway's Law that says your software is going to look how the communication between your teams looks. So I would say this communication between these teams is probably not pretty good. It's probably not very good. And that would lead me to believe that you're going to find exploits when you look deeper into the code. Uh, a note on how some of this stuff is laid out, right? Your, quint your obligatory stack diagram. So we're most concerned with what's going on in the middle. Uh, those are dispensary level trackers. You have MJ Freeway's gram tracker. That's the one that was based on like a six or five or six year old Drupal core with like a bunch of custom plugins that basically made it so that there was no upgrade path. So really, a person could just fingerprint uh, their Drupal instance from afar, go to any like CVE site, and say, what are all the exploits that have been found for Drupal since this version? Uh, and I believe that's what the attackers did, pretty much. Then you have MJ Freeway's uh, MJ platform, and that was supposed to be their new and improved thing made from scratch. I think they got a lot of flack from people in the community, because some of the stuff I saw on Reddit was like, a guy who works in a dispensary, but he also had a lot of technology, maybe even some infosec, and so he was like, hey, I did a scan on uh, my instance of MJ Freeway, and I didn't like what I saw. And I think some of those people were very vocal about that, so perhaps that was part of the motivation for MJ Freeway to roll that out, but then also they were just sitting on Graham Tracker for a while, so you can't really, I mean, you can be the industry leader and not really innovate, and then you, you get surpassed by somebody else, so they didn't want that to happen. Uh, and then we have other third-party dispensary trackers from other companies. Uh, but below that, you have MJ Freeway's Leaf Data System, and that is their state-level compliance tracking. Now, I definitely read something from their marketing department where someone sent them a question saying, isn't this kind of a conflict of interest? And they were like, no, no, that's a separate company. It's OK. Uh, so that was kind of funny. Um, but the middle tier is supposed to integrate with the lower tier. Uh, everything the dispensaries are doing, they have to feed to the government, like I was showing in the previous uh, graph-based slide. Now, a lot of times, uh, these companies, their, their, their selling point is that you will automatically be compliant. Your data that needs to be uploaded to these compliance trackers, will that will be done automatically. Um, so to me, that means that your data is probably being double-dipped, depending on like where you live and where you're buying your legal weed. And if it is a company with not a great track record of security, that's like kind of troubling. Uh, and then if that surface area wasn't enough, you have stuff like um, dynamic websites that are being made by your local mom and pop web developer, web developers. And so they are using the APIs that these uh, trackers offer 
to uh, perhaps you know show the most up to date um, inventory at that dispensary. You have in store menus like the ones you see uh, above the counter at McDonald's, but for weed, and those also integrate with uh, your dispensary tracker. Uh, you have your vendor or supplier, so maybe your processing f- processing facility is directly uploading data to you based on what they're doing. Uh, and then you have mobile apps that again are showing potentially what is available at your local dispensary. So. Those things can be hacked as well. It's a lot of things going on here. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I wound up reading a lot about was MJ Freeway's dealings with uh, the Washington legal cannabis industry and uh, the sort of organizations that exist at the state level that, that are required to implement that. And uh, I would have FOIA'd... Um, I f- in fact, I thought like, oh, f- finally now this is my first chance to like have something good to like submit a FOIA for, and then I like t- seriously mismanaged my time uh, and couldn't. But I found something that's like almost just as good. It, this is a Salesforce instance that has like PDF minutes of every uh, meeting that the Chief Information Officer of Washington State uh, has, and so there are just tons of things about MJ Freeway and uh, their bids to win the contract, and also how they missed deadlines with. Uh, the, the handoff, because Biotrack at some point had that, had this, um, this state contract essentially, and at some point Washington State decided they would rather use MJ Freeway. MJ Freeway missed several deadlines, and so there's much information in here about that. Uh, as well as some posted uh, videos from the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board to dispensary owners telling them not to worry about all the rigmarole that's been going around uh, related to breaches in the cannabis industry. Uh, So back to the code. Uh, Again, I'm not a hacker. Uh, I'm not looking at the code trying to find exploits. I mean, I probably could, I'm sure. Uh, But I thought it would be much more interesting to see what the metadata would say. So I harvested all the emails from Git. Um, Git log lets you format the display in any way you want, so I pretty much made it look like a CSV, and with a minimal amount of deduping and uh, manual cleanup, I wound up with a very long list uh, that is poorly redacted. Now, if you notice, this is just like the A's right here, so it was a pretty extensive list, and you, as you can notice, a lot of those email addresses do not end with mgfreeway.com uh, because they use a lot of dis- of. Uh, a lot of consultants, uh, some of which are offshore or nearshore or probably even working with them for an extended amount of time, but some companies just like to structure themselves that way for whatever reason. Sometimes it's uh, beneficial. Oh, and then after I got these emails, I fed them into Recon NG, which is a fucking amazing tool. Um, I believe I was using the jigsaw puzzle to enumerate on other social media profiles. And although that API key costs like a bajillion dollars, if I had it, I would probably buy it because I'm very nosy. Uh, So okay, collected a lot of stuff. There's much reading to be done. I had blog entries, tweets, Reddit articles, podcast transcripts, training manuals, Git commits, and I found a lot of interesting things. So first off, like I said, um, there are a lot of email addresses that are from contractors, obviously. So I can see the contractor companies because a lot of them end in those URLs. But a lot of them are also Gmail addresses. And some people just would like alternatively commit from their Gmail address or from their work address. I've been there. Uh, I've also fixed it, which is saying a lot because I can be a lazy developer too. Um, but that's the kind of thing I don't, want, I don't want sitting around in a Git repo for other people to look at and point fingers at. Um, and then I noticed, so like if you're looking at the top, what does that mean? I didn't bother verifying it, but my thought is that that's them committing directly from the Git UI. Like, is, is that how you get that email in your, in your uh, Git log? Does anybody know? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one guy made eight commits in a row using just his name as a commit message, which I'm sure the commits weren't all that important. But again, if I was a hacker and I was going to look for uh, exploits in code, I'd probably start with his code. Uh, and so again, lots of remote contractors, uh, lots of various, uh, lots of varying Gmail addresses. Um, I would probably, like if I was a less principled person, fudge one of those Gmail addresses, like make one that's very similar and differs by one letter, and start emailing like everybody on this list. And because I see all your Git commits, like sort of even keeping in mind that this stuff has been leaked, or maybe, you know, if hypothetically we were talking about an open source project, I still feel like if you say some really specific stuff to somebody, that's going to resonate with them. They're going to be like, oh, well, maybe this is legit. 
especially it kind of especially if it looks like an email that I've uh, interacted with before for work and uh, why, why else would I have a reason to doubt such a specific message? So here's what that sweet spear phishing pretext would look like. Hey, developer, uh, I've been dealing with some of your commits as of late, and I wanted to point out that you do this weird thing where you commit from your vagrant environment, because that's what one of those weird ending addresses was too. Uh, that makes it really hard for me to reconcile some of your other work when I rebase off master. Uh, could you please not do that anymore? Also, I think there's some stuff in your local repo that you probably didn't push to master. Would you mind sending me a patch of that? And I think that would work. I don't know. Uh, and I received a little bit of vindication. So when I was reading the subpoena documents uh, that, that um, MJ Freeway submitted to Google, that was one of the email addresses. That's not the person's email address. They swapped two letters. Um, I'm not sure if the attacker tried any social engineering stuff. Uh, it might have just been an address from which they like used to do the smear campaign. And uh, well, I'll tell you about that in a second, actually. So perhaps most interesting is this letter, uh, an open letter to the state of Washington cannabis industry. Um, I'm sorry. I should be looking at you guys and connecting with you, but the icon is really small on my screen. And yeah, well, anyway, so this was written by a guy named Patrick Vo. Uh, president and CEO of Biotrack, and uh, he, I don't even think I found a blog on this site or any other letters, so I thought it was very interesting that they posted this one, and then even a link to download a copy of this, click here. Uh, so there's a lot, it's like eight pages, and it's very heated, uh, he is not happy, um, to, but to just summarize it, he was pretty tight over uh, how things went down in the handoff that I mentioned before from uh, Biotrack to MJ Freeway in Washington State. And uh, he gets at the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board a little bit over their lack of accountability and uh, how they sort of mismanaged the process as far as he was concerned. And uh, he said a lot of things about MJ Freeway, but basically the biggest one was we really can't afford to have our reputation commingled with another company that is this insecure because it will also make us insecure. Which there's some truth to that, but like, they were really what they had to do concretely was like uh, ship around like CSVs by FTP upload. So I'm kind of like, okay, how insecure is that making you really? But you know, I'm not a business owner, so. Uh, but it also references these data ransom attempts that the attackers made. Uh, so he was nice enough to copy and paste uh, a, a message that someone received, and they posted it, I, it, I believe, to a Google group for dispensary owners and workers. Uh, but basically, the attackers were uploading uh, snippets of the data to these like Bitcoin lockbox sites and then ransoming it and sending these emails from spoofed addresses to all these dispensary owners. And uh, I think the prices, I'm not sure if it was for a sample or for the actual dump, but it was like eight bucks. Um, and then also, it's got this like faux, like, I want to mess up your attribution by using what I think a foreigner who doesn't speak English well would type like, you know what I mean? Like, you are by database Bitcoin, 100% anonymous. Uh, and like, I was going to try to see if I could like do some like lay person's threat attribution, but it's kind of obvious here who did it. I probably don't need to go into that anymore. Uh, I didn't have to make that graphic. It was just, it was just a good fit. But jokes aside, why all this animosity? As I said before, I've worked in consulting. Uh, I've worked with some pretty asshole C-level uh, guys who when cameras were off or nobody was around, they would talk shit about their, uh, their employees, their customers, definitely their competitors. But in a public sphere, even if a competitor was like messing up really bad, they would just be really like gracious about it. And I think they understood on some level that engaging in drama is a Pyrrhic victory kind of, right? You probably are just not gonna look good even if you're, you know, you kind of are effectively dragging your uh, opponent down. Uh, so, but, but yeah, again, that spider sense is tingling and I'm basically telling myself there's something else going on here. I don't think that just this idea of, you know, your reputation being commingled with someone insecure is enough for all that vitriol. So I did more digging and as it turns out, there's definitely something. Uh, so apparently, both Biotrack and MJ Freeway were in the same bid to be the state level dispensary, uh, the state level compliance tracker for Puerto Rico. Uh, and because of transparency and how many sort of public records get uploaded now, you can just find information about that. It's posted online. Uh, invitation for bid for C to sale inventory tracking system, PR.gov. 
Wow, okay. Uh, and this is a lawsuit from NJ Freeway against the Puerto Rican Health uh, Department and Biotrack, the winner of the bid. So basically their uh, attitude was, hey, wait a minute, according to Puerto Rican rules, a company that has a felon on the board should not be allowed to win this bid. And as it turned out, Biotrack did have uh, an ex-felon on the board. Uh, now this is something, it, I don't know, this just kind of stuck out to me. Uh, I don't even speak Spanish, but I was like, let me peruse this and see what happens. Uh, inconforme means ha unhappy. I'm not a lawyer, but to me, unhappy sounds like an awfully subjective word to be in a legal document, but that's neither here nor there. It's definitely telling though. Uh, but so, okay, more about, uh, you know, the board member and the, uh, the, 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 fe the felonies or what have you. It was a Mr. Steven Seagal. Uh, not this Steven Seagal, but like it would have been really cool if it was, and I wouldn't have even been surprised to be honest. Uh, and so basically back in 1999, the guy that I am talking about was involved in some mail fraud and some stuff like that. Uh, and so, you know, I guess, objectively speaking, perhaps MJ Freeway had a leg to stand on. But, um, you know, I, I don't really know, like, ethically speaking or morally speaking, like, what, what side I fall on here. But it was definitely entertaining to read about. Mm. And here's another suit that uh, Biotech was involved in. So I guess there's a lot of just litigation in this space in general. It's highly competitive. So, okay, uh, drawing to the end here, but uh, here, right, this is from the timeline again. This is a very dense, you know, snippet from the timeline. And if you look at the top, I'm gonna get up because I can't read what's all the way over there, uh, but I want to speak to that. So, on 8-10-2016, Biotrack gets the highest score in Puerto Rico and wins the contract, right? Uh, on 9-21-2016, MJ Freeway brings a suit in Puerto Rico against Biotrack over the bidding. Uh, on 11-7-2016, uh, Steven Seagal, Steven Siegel, uh, he actually divests his shares, him and another gentleman named Brian McClintock, they sell it to a holding company, so now they're not on the board anymore. So moving forward, MJ uh, Biotrack won't have this problem, right? Uh, and they also put the guy who, like, the guy who's the CEO of the holding company, I believe, they put him on the board instead, right? Which, okay, that's not uncommon. That makes sense. Uh, nine days later, MJ Freeway launches their MJ platform at Marijuana Business Conference here and, and Expo in Las Vegas here. And three days later, they were breached and then double tapped a little bit over a month later. Now, I'm just speculating uh, these things seem pretty related to me. Uh, again, I'm not a hacker. I'm definitely not the person who can do threat attribution. But if I was, I would definitely be looking closer at that. Um, I don't want to say aliens, but, you know. Uh, but then I did install their stuff. I kept saying I'm not a hacker, but I did want to dig around a little bit. But fortunately, uh, a much more experienced person in pen testing uh, wrote me like two weeks before DEF CON, it was like, hey, I'm actually working on some of this stuff and I would love to present. So I'm just gonna leave that as an exercise for him. Uh, but in conclusion, who was to blame? Again, I don't know. I am definitely speculating about all of this really. Uh, but like in my head at some point, I was like, maybe this is some kind of foreign state actor thing, right? It sounds implausible, but I'm not really kidding. Like some of those uh, consulting emails were some, from some pretty interesting uh, places. And also, I would like to think that, um, you know, if I wanted to uh, point out the sort of downsides to, to one's Western capitalist bourgeois ideals, uh, probably shitting on your newfound fledgling vice industry uh, and like, you know, letting it fall on its face, that would probably be a good way to do that. And there's been a lot of psyops going on, so maybe that could be a related thing. Uh, maybe it's like some right-wing anti-weed activists they are, you know, alt-right hackers now. That's a thing. Uh, competitors, perhaps. Very competitive space. Or just maybe bored teenagers, like advanced, persistent ones. Uh, 
the cannabis space has a lot of uh, interesting concerns. Regulations and compliance, uh, there's a lot of it, and when it's done poorly, it equals increased surface area for attack. Uh, the space is obscenely competitive, so if you are weak at all, your competitors will smell your fear and devour you, apparently, with lawsuits and maybe other things. Uh, and also another thing that's interesting is that when you are in the legal cannabis space and you get hacked, you probably are not going to go to the feds. The feds are probably not going to help you, and even if they would, you probably would not want them to help you. Uh, and I didn't change the slide, so I said, come to the Cannabis Village and check this out. But you're here. Thank you. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I believe that is Mr. Lewis in the back with a question. That's right. Uh, on that slide you had for the Puerto Rican uh, litigation, yeah. why was name I don't even know. I was super curious. I think they might have been like second runner up and maybe MJ Freeway was like, both of you. Uh, yeah, and like some of the later uh, lawsuits that I was showing was between Biotrack and other legal uh, cannabis software companies also in Florida. So that, I, I thought that was pretty interesting also. Any, any other questions? Okay. <laughs>